morning. Um, I'm going to talk about something similar to what James and Verona just talked about, looking at the properties of your galaxies, and especially looking at this new uh, hydro simulation, and comparing the differences between your galaxies that are extremely close to uh, Milky Way like host, and looking at how to design it further away. And same goals as we've been talking about for the last uh, 30 to 25 minutes. We're interested in understanding why satellite galaxies and isolated galaxies have their abundances and structures in order to understand things like the busy satellite problem, core versus cusp, too big to fail. And to do this, I'm going to be looking at these new high resolution hydro simulations um, that they also Marino has run called the Veilers. So, in order to introduce this, we're going to look at the cumulative star formation histories of these dwarfs, try to figure out why we separate dwarf galaxies, these different morphological types, um, why dwarf vertical galaxies look different from dwarf regulars, what that says about their uh, buildup of stellar mass through time, also how our galaxies lie on the halo mass stellar mass relationship, and look at their H1 gas content versus stellar mass. So Dan Severino has run these galaxies with the hydroarc code, and in the particular simulation that we're going to examine, this particular box has a box length of 20 uh, inches each 20 parsecs, uh, pretty high resolution dark matter mass, so that's 8 times 10 to the 4 solar masses per particle, and a resolution of 9 interstate parsecs at redshift radius is co moving. So it has extremely high resolution and high redshift, which is important for uh, resolving the small scale stuff that happens at high redshift. And we also have a lot of particles, 30 million particles, as well as all the important physics. We have uh, metal affection, solar winds, supernova feedback, and we include radiation pressure, but we don't uh, add a boost from iron to toner equals zero in this case. So the main halo, I'm zooming in, showing the density plot here. Black, uh, the darker colors are higher density. And you can see the scale shows zero to two megaparsecs across. Give you a feel of the environment of this main halo. Uh, all the results I'm showing are at redshift one. So this halo has a virial mass of seven times 10 to the 11 at redshift one. And we're gonna look at a volume of 250 kiloparsecs around the main halo. And just examine the properties of all the dwarfs within this region. <laughs> just to show you a little more eye candy about the main halo. We see temperature for white is hotter, and metallicity where red is more metal rich. We see that this has pretty active environment. Uh, they stop the high temperature, low temperature region as well as a wide range of metallicities. And so since we care about the satellite galaxy, we're going to look at the distribution around the main halo to show you where these galaxies live. This is just XY and kiloparsecs where the X marks the center of the main halo. And the red circle is the variable radius of that halo, just to give you a feel of where these uh, subhalos live. And the blue dots are the luminous dwarfs, that means they have a stellar mass rating of zero. And all the black dots are the dark dwarfs. And I've cut off the, uh, the selection of the sample to limit it to only halos above a variable mass of 10 to 8, otherwise, we see a ton of black dots. So, once again, we're going to keep with this selection within 250 uh, kiloparsecs and uh, halo mass of 10 to the 8. So for the velocity function of these subhalos, we see that those are the, the black points, and I've just placed a line with the slope of minus 3 on the plot to show you what this would look like. So this is good because it matches, this velocity function matches the velocity function of dark matter only simulations that we've seen in the past, but it's a little worrying because even after including all the relevant physics, we aren't able to lower the slope of our velocity function down to minus one, as you would see in Clifford Bell 2014, as well as Pap uh, and other papers. So our velocity function stays steep, and so this is something interesting that we need to examine further. We're gonna also try looking at uh, simulations that have stronger feedback to figure out why this velocity function slope doesn't change. If we look quickly at the dark satellite galaxy population, I've plotted the halo mass, 
with radius to try to see if there's some trend. Are the dark satellites closer in? What happens? Uh, and you can see that all these objects have virial masses less than 10 to the 9 Nansen, and they're not preferentially closer to their main halo. Uh, but there's many more objects with smaller uh, virial masses, of course. If we move on to looking at the luminous subhalos, and if we compare it to uh, the stellar mass halo mass relation by Baruglio 2013, we can compare our results to those of Shen at all 2013 of the seven dwarfs was for luminous dwarfs in that sample. Uh, the Gerson Campbell 2013 line would be extrapolated further down. And the Miller results would be above. Uh, but we see that Shen's results are at redshift zero. So the dashed line is uh, Peter's line from his paper, and then the dashed dot line is the extrapolation from there on down. Uh, so Shen's dwarfs apply nicely on our relation. And if we look at our galaxy, which are at redshift one, so comparing to the red line. We see that our main halo is actually pretty close to uh, the sun mass it should have within a factor of two, so that's promising. And our dwarf galaxies exist in this locus that's kind of slightly above uh, the redshift one line. But that's probably what you expect because this isn't the mass at the time of accretion. This is the current mass they have. So you expect them to be tightly stripped over time and their virial mass to decrease as they all shift below. So that's interesting, but we also see what has been discussed by James and Bra earlier, is that there's a huge range in stellar mass for a fixed halo mass. And this means that there's no longer the one-to-one -one relation between stellar mass and halo mass, so you really can't apply halo abundance matching techniques at this level of a mass. So even though these dwarf galaxies exist where we think they should, given the information we have, uh, we really can't use any of these extrapolations or anything that uses the halo abundance matching technique at this low mass because there's no longer this one one relationship. If we look at the gas mass to solar mass of these dwarfs, we see that they agree want well with the alfalfa dwarf galaxy sample. I plot a gas mass up here and solar mass up here, and you see there, there's a one to one line, you got dry, and the gray squares are the alfalfa dwarfs. Our dwarf galaxies live where they should in terms of their gas to stellar mass ratio, which is good. And if we move on to figure out how they built up their stellar mass over time, uh, we can look at their average star formation rates. So I've split the, the sample of subhalos into by their stellar mass. So these are all galaxies with stellar mass less than 10 to the 4. So that's a very small stellar mass. And you can see that. For the average across all these galaxies, been within 100 million years steps with look back time. So, this is the early universe here, and this goes down to a redshift one, so zero would be far over there to the right. The average star formation rate for these galaxies ends after reionization. So, these galaxies are very uh, mass, uh, stellar mass light, so their star formation rates are quickly truncated. But for all the rest of our galaxies, with reasonable stellar masses, they have more extended uh, star formation histories. And so this is good. This tells us that we don't find many fossils of reionization and that reionization doesn't completely kill our galaxies even when they have low halo masses. So the average halo mass in this bin is 2.6 times 10 to the 8. And these are the stellar masses between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 m sun. So the average star formation history has an initial burst uh, peak at high redshift, and then you know it has some burst peak features, but it's relatively constant through time with a decreasing slope. And as we step up in mass again to the most massive of our galaxies, we find that there's an increasing star formation rate throughout time, and it's more and more constant. And it looks more like the galaxies we're familiar with from the universe. So this is in agreement with the uh, Wise 2014 results, just uh, qualitatively. Uh, in terms of there's initial burst, but that burst at high redshift doesn't account for the total stellar mass of the object. It's still is able to continue forming stars through the time. So in conclusion, we have this really, we only examined one of many uh, simulations that we're able to look at in this set of velas. And we want to keep looking at the properties of dwarf galaxies around uh, main halos that are Milky Way mass. And to do this, we want to look at both the luminous and the dark sun halos. We want to figure out why our velocity function has a slope of minus 3, 
However, we're unable to bring that down to a slope of minus one, even though we include the <coughs> feedback and radiation pressure. And we find that our main halo and sub halos agree with the stellar halo mass relationship, even though there's a large spread in stellar mass for variable mass, which means we can't really apply the halo <coughs> expansion technique anymore. Also, our stellar mass and gas masses agree with H1 observations, and the star formation in these satellites has an initial burst that is roughly constant, and we don't find that there are many uh, losses of reionization within our sample. So we're very interested in looking at this data more, if you guys have some ideas for what would be interesting for us to examine, uh, because we have this rare set of data where it's high resolution around a Milky Way, so we're able to look at its satellites. Uh, please let us know, and we'll be happy to talk to you.